Um, so you all met me this morning. My name is Holly Ann Garnett. I'm going to be filling in as chair um, for this session today, uh, our first uh, full academic panel on building and breaking confidence in elections. Um, we know that elections are really only as good as they are trusted and as the results are respected. And so we have uh, four papers today. There's one of them, unfortunately, uh, won't be able to present due to illness. Um, but we have four stellar papers that we'll get to uh, hear from today. I thought what the plan of attack will be, will be for each presenter to go through, give about 12, 13-ish minutes. Um, we'll do all the presentations. We'll get Joseph Claver to do our uh, discussant and, and talk a little bit about the papers, and then we'll open it up to q and I'll also be monitoring the chat for questions and answers, um, and we, we'll, we're going to aim to wrap this up uh, in about an hour and a half or so. So that's our plan of attack. And, um, and so without further ado, then, uh, we can start with Christian Schnutt, who will be presenting on perceptions of electoral integrity among political elites, a journey into uncharted territory. Um, so Christian, if you wanted to go ahead, share your screen, um, I'll give you some warnings in the chat when it's, uh, when it's about 10 minutes and then right. later on when it's ready, when we're ready to, to wrap up. So go for it, Christian. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot for the intro. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Christian Schnaut. I'm a postdoctoral researcher and lecturer at the University of Mannheim in Germany. And um, I'm very happy to be here and to present my work on perceptions of electoral integrity among political um, elites and to kick off our panel on making and breaking confidence in elections. My talk will be roughly divided into two or two blocks with four parts in total. I will briefly give an overview on the background and motivation of my paper. Um, we'll give you an outline of the theoretical expectations and hypothesis. I will keep that short given the time we have. And we'll then go on to the main part of my talk, which will be the presentation of the empirical findings. And I will then conclude with a discussion of the most important findings and their implications. Um, to start with, I think it's a fair assumption um, that everyone attending this conference will probably agree that elections are the cornerstone of representative democracy. Um, elections do not only determine who's getting what, when, and how but elections also perform an important legitimizing function. So elections grant legitimacy to elected representatives, but they also strengthen the belief of citizens and other gatekeepers in the political system in the legitimacy of the political system as a whole. And um, given that important function of elections, um, it can be argued that perceptions about the fairness and proper conduct of elections can be seen as an important indicator for the general viability and functioning of today's political systems. And um, what you can see here, I've labeled this as some sort, they fulfill the function of a cannery in a coal mine back in the day. So in case there's something wrong with elections, with the electoral process, we can look at perceptions of people in order to see whether the system is still functioning or not. Looking at how democracies, how political systems um, fare in reality, we see, and we've heard that um, earlier today from Holly Ann, that um, in most advanced democracies, um, electoral integrity is high, not in all, but in most, and serious instances of electoral fraud and malpractices are few and far between. Um, of course, the US is. Um, a prominent case where electoral integrity is going down, but um, in many advanced democracies, especially in Europe, electoral integrity is still considered pretty high. Um, despite the overall high quality of elections, um, in recent years, elections have increasingly come under attack from within, as I would label it, with the political elites challenging the integrity of the electoral process and calling its outcomes into question. And that might be a development uh, we should worry about, or at least important enough to have a look at in order to see what are the, the or what is the impact of these developments for the quality of democracy and the state of the political systems in general. Why would we bother, um, given the rhetoric and false allegation of some political elites across certain advanced democracies, political elites themselves may pose a challenge to democracy. And I think that's a topic worth having a look at in more 
detail. To give you an impression of what I mean, um, I've brought with me two examples, two quotes. The first is by Donald Trump, actually from the 6th of January of 2021. We will never give up. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. We don't concede when there's theft involved. And the second example is actually coming from Germany, on which my presentation will be based um, in the remainder of my talk as well, just to show you that even a country that is among the top 10 of electoral integrity ratings in the world um, does exhibit or does um, have political elites which are actually discrediting the electoral process. And the quote here is, this whole pandemic is a deception brought up for a completely different reason. To conduct large-scale postal voting in order to accomplish the most extensive vote rigging this country has ever seen. So this is actually a quote by um, a representative of the German right-wing populist AFD party. And this is basically the, the, the starting point of my talk. Um, when we compare these real-world developments um, with, with the state of the art in, in, in research on electoral integrity, we, we, we have to admit that basically there is ample evidence on the objective quality of elections as measured by expert surveys. There is ample evidence on citizens' electoral integrity beliefs referring to both causes and consequences, but we basically have hardly any knowledge on the electoral integrity beliefs of political elites aside from the rhetoric they uh, provide us with from time to time and from which I've taken these examples before. So I think uh, with my paper, I'm basically entering uncharted territory by having a look at political elites, electoral integrity perception, using the example of political candidates running for office in the 2021 German federal election. And I want to answer two rather simple questions. The first one is, how do political elites perceive the integrity of elections? and which factors may help us to account for differences in their electoral integrity beliefs. And that's more or less uh, the aim for my paper and for this presentation. Um, I've developed in total three hypotheses that may help us to explain differences in electoral integrity beliefs. The first stems from experiential theories of um, electoral integrity perceptions and basically states that negative experiences during the campaign period should lead to more negative perceptions of electoral integrity um, as compared to candidates that had more positive experiences. Um, the second one is based on communication theories, um, highlighting the role of partisan cues and elite rhetoric. And here we know from real world examples that it's primarily partisan cues, elite rhetoric from populist parties that try to um, call into question the integrity of elections. So the hypothesis here states that populist candidates running for populist parties will exhibit more negative perceptions of electoral integrity than candidates running for non-populist parties. And the last one is probably also very familiar uh, to, to most of us. Um, it's the so-called winner-loser hypothesis or the winner-loser gap, which can be transferred, of course, also to electoral integrity perceptions. And here the hypothesis would be um, that electoral defeat in the 2021 campaign and repeated electoral defeats in previous election campaigns should lead to more negative perceptions of electoral integrity among candidates as compared to those who have been more successful previously. This, in very brief, the, the theoretical underpinnings of what I'm going to, to look at in my talk and in my paper, um, because of the time I go not much into detail here, we can discuss this in the Q&A later. Um, what kind of data am I using? Um, and I think this is kind of a unique opportunity for the first time, at least to, to my knowledge, that um, the German Longitudinal Election Study has included some items on electoral integrity perceptions in its latest wave uh, running from October 19 to January 31. Um, so directly after the latest um, German federal election. In total, there's information on 735 candidates from the seven major parties running for office in the latest federal elections. And in total, there's information on four different facets of candidates' electoral integrity perceptions. 
So looking at the first goal of this paper, basically to, to map electoral integrity beliefs among um, political elites, we see here the four um, items that I'm looking at, and it already becomes clear that perceptions of electoral integrity are rather positive, especially looking at panel A and B, where um, candidates were asked about elections as being free and fair and postal ballots as secure, we see that the, yeah, the overwhelming majority is clearly in favor of integrity in German elections. When we look at evaluations of the campaign period, we see that um, chances to present own positions and to present uh, positions of the respective parties of the candidates are considered less positive. So um, here we see slightly differences depending on which phase of the electoral process we are looking at. If we split this by party affiliation, um, comparing non-populist, populist right and populist left parties, we already see um, that in particular populist right parties have much more negative perceptions of electoral integrity. And I think the best example is here looking at postal ballots um, as being secure or not, we see that the German AFD, the right-wing populist party, um, is strongly disagreeing, or candidates from this party are strongly disagreeing that postal ballots in Germany were secure. So the uh, first evidence that there is some partisan bias in electoral integrity perceptions among political elites. Looking at multivariate models, um, trying to account for the factors that try to predict differences in these four facets, we start with campaign experiences in the first block, and we basically see that there is hardly any significant effect observable. What we see is that um, feelings of insecurity have a consistent impact across all four facets. So the more insecure candidates were feeling during the campaign, the more negative their perceptions are, but the effects are rather small. Um, furthermore, there are some effects for negative media portrayals. So if candidates perceived media portrayals to be relatively negative, then their perceptions of electoral integrity were also more negative. Um, that's basically the, the first main result referring to hypothesis one. Um, going to hypothesis two, testing the impact of party affiliation, we see a consistent impact across all facets of electoral integrity perceptions, um, showing that in particular populist right party candidates um, have the most negative perceptions of electoral integrity, but also candidates running for the populist left party in Germany, Die Linke, um, exhibit more negative perceptions of electoral integrity than mainstream candidates. Last but not least, hypothesis three shows us the impact of winning or losing in elections. And also here we see that in particular losing in the 2021 electoral contest leads to more negative or is associated with more negative perceptions of electoral integrity. The most interesting part here is panel B, um, again, looking at postal ballots, where we see that there is hardly any significant effect, except for the populist right party AFD. And there is a small effect also for previous electoral defeats, but this is very much in line with the rhetoric of that party in the German electoral campaign, really discrediting the security of uh, postal voting, which is also in line with the quote, which I was showing you at the beginning of my talk. All right. I'm already coming to an end, um, summarizing the most important findings. First of all, editorial integrity perceptions among German political elites are overall rather positive. We see that they are most positive with regard to the fairness of electoral procedures and the elections as such. They are more negative concerning the fairness of the campaign period um, associated with chances or fair chances to present their positions. Interestingly, I've made a comparison, this is part of another paper, with citizens' electoral um, integrity beliefs, and the findings show that overall elites' views about the integrity of elections are much more um, extreme. So they are more positive on the one hand uh, compared to citizens, but they are also more negative regarding 
uh, evaluations of the campaign period. Regarding the predictors of elites' electoral integrity perceptions, we see that there are strong differences between candidates from non-populist and populist parties. There is strong evidence for a winner-loser gap. And at the same time, we see that direct experiences during the campaign period do not seem to matter much. Finally, what does that mean? First, candidates' electoral integrity perceptions largely correspond with the dominant leadership rhetoric of their political parties, meaning that it was especially populist parties and the AFD discrediting the elections. Second, we see that electoral success and defeat seem to matter for electoral integrity perceptions, showing again that apparently evaluations concerning the integrity of elections do not follow from the quality of the electoral process as such, but rather reflect satisfaction with outcomes. So there's some sort of amalgamation between process and outcome evaluations. And this leads me to my main implication or my main conclusion that basically considering my results, candidates' electoral integrity perceptions depend on factors that are largely independent from the quality of the electoral process itself. And if this is the case, we have to go back and basically ask ourselves what kind of position um, perceptions of electoral integrity among polit uh, political elites can actually play as an indicator uh, of the well-being for modern democracies. And that's it. I hope I stayed roughly within time. Um, thanks a lot for your attention. Perfect. Thank you so much, Christian. Um, and moving right along, uh, we'll move to our second presenter, uh, which will actually be Marcel Morris and company, um, who will be presenting to aggregate or not expert perception responses to electoral integrity in close elections. Um, and so that's with, with the team of scholars that I think you can present for us, Marcella. Um, so I'll be keeping the clock for you and um, we'll be writing in the chat as your time uh, gets to, to the end. So take it away, Marcel. Great, thanks so much. Um, and thank you for that introduction, Holly. Um, and thank you guys for all being here today. Um, this is a project focused on kind of unpacking some of the unique challenges around how we aggregate the kind of fixed indices and kind of overall aggregate measures of electoral integrity. So kind of thinking about how we think about um, the data that we're using. Um, this is a paper, it's a collaboration with myself, um, Ian Batista and David Carroll from the Carter Center. Um, and that kind of informs the perspective and the overall kind of approach of what we're, uh, what we're doing and kind of the questions we're trying to ask. And so I'll jump right into it. Um, the general idea of this paper started from observing things like what happened in the 2011 South Sudanese um, independence refer referendum where voters joyfully kind of showed their ballots as they cast them um, and celebrated the truly unique and um, long fought uh, path that got them to a very successful independence referendum and national independence. Um, critically, this goes against what we would consider secrecy of the ballot, which is an extremely important part of electoral integrity and of election serving as a um, you know, vox populi un, uh, uh, without any kind of pressure um, unnecessarily from the other side of things. Um, but it's clear that the intent of the voters here was to celebrate and was um, not out of some sort of administrative problem or pressure. Um, but again, kind of thinking about how we think about what we observe on election day, what informs our understanding of what electoral integrity is, this kind of comes along full circle for more, you know, current and modern elections where we have um, ballots, ballot selfies and these types of things. Um, and where and when these things really matter really depends on context. Um, because as we all know, secrecy ballot is important. It is something that is included in our data sets. It is a PDI question or two. Um, and it's something that is really important when it is when it matters for the security of the election and not maybe not as much when it is, uh, you know, an overall enthusiasm for the entire process. Um, we can see another kind of example of this type of challenge to um, what we would consider free and fair elections. What I'm showing you here is a very close zoom in of the electoral, um, the congressional districts in the state of Maryland, um, which was half of one of the most recent Supreme Court um, cases about political gerrymandering. Um, and you can see some real creative uses of I think the second congressional district actually uses a bridge to maintain con con uh, uh, to continue 
um, and allow for the district to be contiguous, which is a requirement of US congressional districts. And that I believe there's a bridge that connects two parts of that. Right? So really creative ways we can think about where and how something like gerrymandering, which has less data across it cross national or to measure it cross nationally, PEI does include it in the in the in the questions, but where borders are drawn in a way that are exclusionary and extremely problematic, we could we could see a world where that could throw serious doubt on any of the ability to compete or to have a free and fair election. And it would show up in a fraction of the data that we're using to aggregate the overall um, validity and integrity of that election. And so how we build these indices has to matter and where these indices need to flex and need to kind of allow for these types of challenges is extremely context specific and is extremely hard because individual elections do face unique challenges. We know that. Um, running elections is extremely difficult, even in really good systems and states um, and small challenges kind of always happen on election day, monitors see them, electoral observers see them, but it doesn't necessarily condemn the election overall. Um, there are these kind of structural and idiosyncratic processes that we're trying to work through. Um, and the kind of data standards we have ask experts to address these components and we, then we aggregate them up along the way in a standard measure across uh, across all contexts, which sounds great from an academic perspective. It gives us really clean and wonderful data. But what we're trying to do is better unpack where that may break down a little bit. Because um, there may be a better way to aggregate this. We may need to think about a better way to aggregate this that's more flexible and robust. And we're making the argument that this should be most important in close elections. And that's where we're kind of zooming in and looking because everything kind of matters a little bit more when the results are close. Any different part that breaks is potentially going to change the results. Um, and so generally what we're looking for to, is to better understand um, how well a standardized formula across elections can um, capture important differences across cases. And is that good or bad for electoral integrity measurement? So we kind of formulate this in a research question of under what conditions does the difference between the experts overall rating and the formulaic index change and flex. And so we can do this. Um, the PEI as well as kind of VDEM has an equivalent and we've run it with both. We're looking at the PEI today. Um, includes an, a question that's a one to 10 scale for experts to rate the, um, their overall interpretation of the election's integrity. And then that's excluded from the index, which is aggregated out. And so that's the kind of world that we're working in and the data that we're considering. And we know that this is um, a hard thing to study, right? But there are things we expect, right? The large, stronger democracies are going to have better elections, they're gonna have closer elections. And electoral autocracies have different dynamics and potentially even different goals with elections. And we see that kind of in the data here where the x-axis is the margin of victory, um, the, number, the percentage of votes but, uh, that determine the election between the top two vote getting parties. And then the delta variable is the difference where we just subtract a rescaled version of the rating variable from the index itself um, at the election level. And it, we expect some of what we find, we're hoping to unpack that a little bit more. And so here we're using VDEM for controls and PEI mostly for the, um, the key independent and dependent variables. We can do this from 2013 to 2019. We probably can update this with the new data. Um, we haven't gotten to that point yet, but um, with the new survey that came out, we should be able to do that as well. Um, and then, like I said, we subtract the rating from the index, and rescale those to be comparable, and we end up with this delta variable, which is truly the difference between kind of what the expert overall says uh, along their own kind of weighting system of how well they, they think the election did compared to what we've aggregated, what is aggregated out of all of the answers to their questions. And so this kind of, where does that difference come in um, to play here? And then the independent variable is um, a kind of sty a stylized version to make regression results more easily interpretable, just the difference between the part, the, the first top, the first vote getting party and the second vote getting party um, subtracted from 100. So the kind of margin of victory.
Um, and so what does this actually look like in practice? Um, this is a histogram of the distribution of the delta variable collect, or constructed at actually the expert level. And so what we would expect if these are harmonious and kind of one-to-one, -one, um, we would see a peak around zero where index and um, rating are equal or at least very, very close. And that's actually not what we're seeing in this distribution. And that to some degree is what we're trying to unpack is how, when, and where does that come up? Um, now, a better, a different question you can ask is where does this actually occur? And so here on the x-axis, we have the, the delta variable, that difference between rating and index. And on the y-axis, we have how close the election is with, how, with closer elections towards the top. The colors are regime type according to VDAM. And as we see, lighter colors are stronger democracies. They have closer elections. And in this case, um, we see that the more often the index score is higher than the experts overall rating. And the kind of inverse is true on this other side on the, um, the positive scale of the Delta variable where elections are less close. Um, we see darker colored regimes, so lower democracy scores and a, a different dynamic within those um, kind of Delta variables where the rating actually is higher than the index making it a positive score. And so um, zooming in on closed elections, like I said, we were gonna be talking about, we see kind of a different, less clean um, discussion or less clean development of the actual elections themselves. And so this is what we've kind of said, close elections are, are elections that are decided within 5% of the vote. So 95, so um, a vote difference of, of, of 5% or less. And so again, kind of a different distribution, a little bit less, um, clear as to what's going on here, but also an interesting way to do this. And here that X axis is the Delta variable, but it's the absolute value. So the interpretation of positive and negative kind of goes away, but we start to see a better, an interesting pattern in the distribution. So in order to test this, um, statistically, we throw these into regression models. Um, I'm gonna show you some of those results here, um, but generally what we're seeing is a small, but robust to um, a number of controls that there is some sort of difference here that as elections get closer um, or closer elections end up seeing differences in this that, that stand up to controlling for standard things. And so uh, model one is just our independent variable on the dependent variable. So just the vote margin on the Delta variable um, with country clusters and year fixed effects. Model two includes some controls, drops the fixed effects. Panel three, um, sorry, model three includes, um, throws the fixed effects back in. So we have controls for regime type and the, the best version of that from VDEM without a true election component is the polyarchy. And so we're trying to keep this as clean as we can um, with that. And so I am at 10 minutes, great. Okay, um, so I'll skip over these. It's actually not acting the same way we thought it would for close elections and sweep elections that may be driving some of these results when we break it down by categories but we can talk more about that in the Q and A. Um, but so generally, what are we trying to do, right? We're trying to better understand, pay attention to the conditions where the perceptions of experts may be different in the aggregate from what the, the answers to how we scaffold up these things are, right? Is there some sort of rebalancing that experts are actually able to do better than a standardized measure based on the countries that they're, they're surveyed about? And so we're trying to better understand that process. Um, we've found a small, granted, but robust different in this measure. And so we're, there's, there may be a there there that we're trying to unpack a little bit more and better understand. To do that, we realize there's more work to do. And what we're pretend, potentially thinking about doing and moving in the, the direction given um, who we are and where we're working and, and the kind of collaborators we have is to um, look at the different parts of the electoral system, especially as the Carter Center breaks it out through the election standard and obligations handbook into the different time periods and to see if this, there are potential areas where this flex is more or less. Um, consider other kind of cut points and other ways to, to divide up the data, um, as well as explore other in independent variables. Maybe it's not about close elections, maybe it's about something else, as well as potentially dive in um, with case studies to kind of tease out what some of these, what the exemplar cases are for these different perspectives. 
And so with that, um, thank you for your time. Thanks for coming today. And I look forward to the comments and questions later. Thanks, Marcella. And you, you were doing just fine for time. It was just more of a, a reminder. It wasn't a, you need to stop now, but hopefully we'll have a really good discussion about this. I know that I have tons of things I want to chat about, about this. This is fantastic. Okay, so let's move on to our third paper then. Um, so that is going to be um, Maria and Anna, the, both from the University of Vienna, and they're going to be speaking about election integrity, political efficacy, and the meaning of voting. Um, and so I'll put my timer on, same thing as before, and let you get going. Yeah, I can see it great. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much uh, for, for the space and, and for the introduction. We're very excited to share with you a draft version of a paper we're working on with, with my co-author, Analia uh, Brunetti, on election integrity, turnout, and the meanings of voting. This is part of a larger project we are conducting at the University of Vienna uh, called Devote Project. And um, the question, the main question guiding our paper is uh, whether and how public perceptions uh, of election uh, integrity can influence voter turnout. This is something that has been studied a lot within the literature and we want to contribute to this conversation by focusing on the extent to which the association between perceptions of, of election integrity and turnout can be explained uh, by a new variable meant to capture the meanings citizen assigned to voting. Uh, which are defined uh, in, in this work as, as the different understandings and, and definitions that individuals can assign to this act of voting. And uh, we believe that addressing this question is, is relevant for several reasons, many of, of the ones that have already been discussed uh, before, but as we all know, free and fair elections are relevant pieces of, of democracies, and when elections work well, they can uh, provide legitimacy to authorities, hold governments accountable, link citizens with representatives, and so on. But however, in, in recent years, we have been seeing deteriorating perceptions of election integrity, which are in increasingly characterizing both established and non-established democracies. And along this, this concern, we are also witnessing that uh, voting particip participation has been falling in recent decades. And there is this uh, popular perception that uh, irregularities in electoral conduct or the perception of these irregularities could be exacerbating this, this problem. So our point of, of departure is the literature on integrity that states precisely that uh, perceptions of electoral integrity or of electoral malpractice and the lack of confidence in election results could translate into lower levels of turnout. There are several studies supporting uh, uh, this, these findings with results in, in African and Latin American countries, as well as in cross-national context. And the argument behind this association stems from rational choice theory and social psychology theories, and it's very straightforward that uh, voters have less incentives to vote when they think that uh, the polls are corrupt and the results have already been decided. So in, in other words, that perceptions of electoral fraud can raise the costs of voting compared to uh, the benefits that citizens can derive from participation. But uh, this mechanism relies on, on an assumption that is that all citizens uh, link voting to the election, election outcome, um, an expectation from rational choice theory that states that uh, people vote to influence the outcome of an election, and as a result, if individuals perceive the outcome to be already decided, they have no incentives to vote. But uh, this mechanism uh, that, that explains this association has been, at least to the best of our knowledge, not studied in depth so far. And we know from the academic literature that there are other conceptualizations of voting and other motivations uh, to vote that coexist with the more instrumental approaches to the, to the act of voting. And uh, while we can presume that uh, evaluations of the reliability of elections could take place before considerations regarding the decisiveness of, of one's vote, the role of integrity could also fluctuate when there are other motivations in place. And previous authors have already stated that the impact of electoral integrity may not be so straightforward. So our work uh, focuses 
uh, mainly on, on citizens' perceptions of electoral integrity as our, our independent variable. And we depart from a process-based approach to incorporate indicators of integrity in different stages of the electoral process. And uh, the focus on perceptions instead of, of actual level of election integrity or uh, the, the um, uh, experts' views on electoral integrity response to the fact that this can differ substantially. And the question for us is not whether citizens can judge correctly the electoral practices, but rather whether and how uh, public perceptions can influence uh, citizens' behavior, even if, if perceptions are erroneous or citizens do not have first-hand information about the specificities of the electoral process, how citizens view and judge the electoral conduct can still uh, potentially trigger different behaviors. So uh, this is our point of, of departure, and we want to integrate this research on citizens' evaluations of electoral processes with uh, traditional concerns of electoral behaviorists and the motivations on, on turnout and why people vote. So uh, as I was saying before, we know that there are different uh, alternative explanations to why people vote. And voting has not only been traditionally understood as an instrumental act where the goal is to influence the outcome of an election, but also as an expressive mechanism used to signal agreement with ideas, values or groups, or as a symbolic event whose role is, is closely related to democratic uh, values and participation. And our, our paper will study then the role that citizens' uh, own meanings of voting, their, their own understandings of the act of voting, uh, assigned uh, across two different dimensions, the probability of attributing a, uh, a meaning to voting, that is, whether or not citizens find a meaning in voting, and the specific contents across these three uh, dimensions, instrumental, expressive, and uh, symbolic meanings. And uh, I will briefly go into our hypotheses and expectations. And uh, the first one is what has been mostly studied, um, that citizens' perception of, of election integrity correlate with the likelihood of casting a vote. And uh, this stems from, from the rational choice theory that the unfairness of electoral processes can determine the cost and, and the benefits of voting. However, uh, we expect that the likelihood of assigning a meaning to voting and the content of these meanings can impact the relationship between election integrity, the perceptions of election integrity, and electoral participation differently. So our second hypothesis um, states that having no meaning will weaken this, this relationship, even when citizens perceive that elections are, are fair, if they do not attribute a meaning to voting, they may still be less inclined to vote. And for those citizens who do attribute a meaning to voting, we believe that different understandings can also influence the direction in which uh, perceptions of integrity influence participation. As I mentioned before, focus on these three possible meanings that are derived from the scholarly literature, the instrumental, expressive, and symbolic. So our third hypothesis uh, follows uh, the traditional rational choice theory, indicating that uh, the association between integrity and turnout will be strengthened for instrumental voters who are motivated by their goal of influencing the result of, of an election and would be otherwise deterred from, from participating if they feel like the elections were rigged. Hypothesis four, on the other hand, focuses on expressive voters. And here we expect these voters to be more likely um, to, to vote, even if an election is perceived to be unfair. And this is explained because of the utility that they uh, derive from participating does not depend uh, necessarily on the consequences of their vote choice, but rather on being able to express their, their preferences. And finally, regarding uh, symbolic meanings of voting here, the relationship for us is not as straightforward. So we rely on two contending hypotheses and we would love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, but uh, the first one would be that uh, symbolic voters could be argued to still vote regardless of the perceived level of integrity because they can consider voting as, as a duty uh, or a political right that citizens should exercise 
So following the literature on voter psychology that stresses this role of duties and responsibilities as motivations. And on the other hand, citizens with symbolic meanings um, who do not trust the, the electoral process could be also less likely to go to the polls if they feel that the democratic conditions that they value are not met. And we test our hypothesis using original survey data um, collected in a variety of countries with different levels of election integrity and democratic performance around the world that are holding elections in the year 2022. This is part of a larger data collection within the Devol project. Um, and each country, uh, the, the survey is administered two months before a national legislative election takes place in that country. So far, the sample of countries includes Colombia, Serber, Serbia, Hungary, and Australia. And the idea is that the variation of countries with different levels of election integrity and turnout will help us uh, generalize uh, our, our results. And uh, going quickly into our variables and some descriptive statistics, the, the, the data collection is still ongoing and we are coding some of our, our, our uh, variables. So uh, this is a little bit preliminary still. But well, our independent variable is the perceptions of, of election integrity. And uh, for this, we, we are capturing the level of agreement on a zero to 10 scale um, on, on a series of statements of integrity and mark practice. And to operationalize this, we created an aggregate index uh, out of the different survey items and inverted their mark practice indexes. Um, the figure on screen shows the variation in the perceived levels of integrity between the countries with the uh, highest values in Australia and the lowest ones uh, in Serbia. We also conducted factor analysis to see if it made sense to have all items in one dimension and uh, our results show that it, it does, but we can come back uh, to this later in the Q&A as well. Um, our dependent variable is uh, electoral participation measured as the intention to vote. So uh, from a continue, continuous variable from zero to 10, and um, you can see the, the results here. And since voting intentions were measured two months before the actual election, we also compared uh, the reported intention with the actual turnout in, in each country to see if there was any kind of overrepresentation in, in, in those responses. And uh, thirdly, our moderator, the citizens' meanings of voting, are being constructed from open-ended questions following the work on the meanings of democracy. We asked citizens to answer, what does voting mean to you? Uh, with follow-up questions on, uh, does voting mean anything else? To, to prompt more answers. And uh, we are looking at these two dimensions, the probability of finding a meaning and the content of these meanings regarding the instrumental, expressive, and symbolic meanings of voting. And uh, the idea behind this inductive approach is uh, not to, to constrain responses to previously created categories within the dimensions, but allow for more uh, spontaneous answers and to discover uh, new meanings of voting other than the ones already present in the literature. And right now we are in the process of coding the open-ended answers to enhance reliability, we are first separating uh, answers into quasi-sentences uh, by chunking the full answers into single statements uh, without coders' involvement. And then we're working with uh, two independent coders. So now I can only show you some uh, statistics of a closed-ended question that is accompanying this, um, this, uh, this data collection process in which we ask people their agreement with statements about the meanings of voting to them, uh, which we later regrouped into these uh, three categories plus the, the no meaning. As you can see now, the distribution of items of screen is more about the influence than about the expression and the democratic values aspect. And uh, these are the, the main uh, results for, for each country with a mean level of agreement for these items. And uh, from this, we can see, first of all, that um, voting is a multidimensional concept. Next to the instrumental category, respondents also identify with expressive and symbolic meanings of voting, which um, somewhat supports our, our assumption that citizens do not necessarily link voting to the election outcome alone, but also perceive it as 
as uh, an expressive opportunity and a symbolic opportunity. Um, second, that the level of agreement in the symbolic meanings, which is the, the grayish color on screen, um, is, is also relatively uh, large compared to the other two, which are the most studied. Uh, so this also brings interesting points about uh, the motivations to go out and vote. And uh, lastly, just to, to finish up that there is a gap between uh, the no meanings items and the rest, which could indicate uh, that citizens find a meaning more often than not. And that is all for now. To sum up, we would love to hear uh, your thoughts and in your comments on this. We have some open questions that we would like to ask uh, regarding how to best aggregate items and invert malpractice indexes with the integrity ones if uh, we are making a convincing statement or not about the link between the literature and election integrity and instrumental voting and so on. But we are uh, looking forward to, to your comments and, and your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, just right on time. Uh, that's fantastic. And I've noticed a really, uh, really great chat going on in, in, um, in the chat function. Um, I really like what Stephanie did where she kind of at the author that she's interested because in, I was having a bit of a hard time figuring out who was meant for what. So, so um, that might be a, a best practice we can use in the conference moving forward. All right, our last presenter to well, yeah, today um, is Leah Maravaki and Mara Sutman Lee, who I believe might be here or might be coming. Uh, but Leah, you said you're going to be um, presenting. So uh, you can take it away here. The presentation is on the impact of voter education on voter confidence, evidence from the 2020 US presidential election. And I'll start the timer for you. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Holly. So great to be here and um, I love I loved all the presentations so far. I'm so happy that I get the opportunity to see what everyone is doing. Um, everyone can see this all right? Yep, we're good. Yeah, you. perfect. Um, so Mara is uh, here. Uh, I will be presenting on our behalf. Um, we are here to um, present some new research that we're working on relating to voter education and building off on um, our general uh, agenda that revolves around voter education and how it affects the voter experience. Um, so we are building off research that talks about why, um, why which factors affect uh, um, voter confidence, the idea that votes were counted as intended. Um, and this is very similar to what Christian presented first um, as to the different um, influences for voters, such as whether your, can your preferred candidate won or lost the election, whether the voter has predispositions and perceptions about existing voter fraud that affects uh, attitudes about accuracy uh, of the vote count. Uh, research shows that experiences with uh, election administration, whether you waited in line or whether the poll worker gave you a hard time, they asked you for an ID or any other issues in the process of casting a ballot also can affect uh, voter accuracy and confidence in how your election administrators at the local and state level uh, are doing their job. Uh, there's also research that talks about um, what we mean by voter confidence, uh, Alon Atkinson's uh, very, very important research on, we have different measures of how we think about voter accuracy, one being uh, my personal vote counted as intended, votes in my county, so in my local jurisdiction, votes in my, in my state of residence and votes state, uh, nationwide. And we have been observing, this is a very standard pattern that the further away from home, uh, the less likely um, voters are to feel that their votes are counted as intended. So we want to investigate whether voter education uh, plays a role in explaining those differences in voter accuracy. And of course, if there's any significant effect in um, decreasing concerns about accuracy in voting. Um, we, our research with Mara builds uh, a theoretical framework to introduce voter education in the whole um, mechanism of how mobilization, um, campaign effects, other uh, factors, administrative factors, institutional factors affect uh, the uh, voter behavior and the voter experience. We argue that voter education or informs voters about the mechanics of voting, how to register, how to request a ballot, how to show up and how to, how to vote. And 
make your vote counted, and also how elections work, what is happening um, in the back, um, the process that voters are not really uh, familiar with, like audits or registration records. And very importantly, how election officials keep elections secure. Uh, we argue that building of Atkinson and Saunders, we argue that uh, voter education connects voters to their election officials. They know who that person is and the job they're doing. It improves the voter experience and very importantly, it increases transparency in the election process. So our theory here is that there are all these underlying mechanisms and all of this, they work together and they connect voter education to voter confidence. Uh, election officials are credible sources of information. When they communicate to voters, they build trust. Voters uh, are more connected to the local election officials rather than uh, their state, but in relation to their legislators, they're definitely more connected to the local election officials. Like voters are less likely to make mistakes when they have information. And of course, uh, they learn about the process and that creates transparency. We argue specifically that they're not going to change the hearts and minds of every voter, but they, they have the potential to assuage concerns um, or inoculate some voters who are more predisposed to have negative uh, attitudes, such as those who prefer candidate lost or those who are more predisposed to believe that there is rampant voter fraud or that elections are, uh, are stolen. And this is particularly important in the context of 2016 and 2020 in the United States. Our contribution is that uh, we try to establish an empirical relationship between voter education and voter confidence. We talk about it a lot. We say that it matters, but we haven't really tested it empirically. We also try to uh, overcome the major challenges with studying voter education because there's no data sets of voter education where we can say this is what X state is doing and X locality is doing, and that's a major challenge. We have um, a great database of social media voter education efforts, but it's not enough. So what we try to do in this paper, uh, we try to measure um, state level investment and local level investment in voter education, A, from measuring social media activity, but also from uh, investments by states and localities through federal, state and private funding in 2020. So we use 2020 obviously as a case study. Um, our key independent variables are uh, social media activity by the state election official um, Facebook page, the official account. And also we have different measures of how much money states spent um, and they allocated on communications from the federal uh, program, the CARES Act in 2020 how much money states allocated on communications from their matched funds from, CARES, from the CARES Act. And also we try to add a measure of county level involvement as an additional investment in voter education. Uh, the proportion of jurisdictions within a state that was awarded a CTCL grant, that's a center for tech and civic life that provided private funds. Um, many states use that money to bolster um, election administration and many of them invested in voter education through these funds. We draw from several data sources. Uh, our major source is the survey of the performance of American elections. It's a great survey of election administration. It has the four measures of voter confidence. It is uh, weighted by registered voters. Uh, voters are validated for uh, their Voter, um, whether they voted or not, it's a great resource. We supplemented with our election official social media voter education project. That's Mara's uh, baby. Um, we get we got data on spending from the CARES Act, from the Election Assistance Commission, and the CTCL's list of uh, those jurisdictions that got um, a CTCL grant in 2020. And our dependent variables are four: the different voter confidence measures, my vote, votes in my county, counted as intended, votes in my state, and votes nationwide. So um, we usually don't report control variables when we present, but it is important to, to note what kind of, uh, what other measures we can control for through these data sets. Uh, evaluations of election administration, uh, whether our state and local election commission uh, official, um, they're committed to running free and accurate election, fair and accurate elections, whether the respondent is a first time voter, how they voted, whether they feel that election outcomes are fair. Uh, we have six measures of voter fraud, whether the voter believes that they occur frequently, 
the standard demographics, party ID and ideology, and to kind of measure, uh, have some measure of the winner loser effect, we control for whether the voter voted for Trump um, or Hillary or other in 2016. Uh, this is, uh, we have a series of descriptive tables. One of them is, you know, what our dependent variables measure up. Um, and as you will see, there is this dissipation of confidence the further away we move from my from the personal level, which again is not surprising and it's very consistent. And we're here to understand why. This is a snapshot of uh, the variation across the states uh, on what we mean by social media activity. We have states that have been operating a Facebook account for years, and they might be more. They might that might mean that they have institutionalized voter education on social media. Uh, we also have a measure of total posts, but we use um, uh, two dummy variables, one for whether the account posts at least once a day. This is based on guidelines on effective communication through social media, so we use those measures, and another one whether state posts two or more times um, a day. Uh, we also have uh, a nice visual of the, the notable variation across the states in how they spent uh, money from the CARES Act, whether they spent at all, and how much they allocated on communications, and then how much money they matched and spent on communications. There were some states that um, the state legislature did not authorize uh, care spending at all, so that's a zero. There were some states that spent a significantly little or not at all to communications, but they did invest in communications through their funds that they had to match. Matching was not a requirement, so we consider that the fact that states did match some funds had to be an extra uh, commitment to voter education. So an overview of our findings, yes, a good news, we find that voter education does affect voter confidence, particularly at the personal and state level. Of course, uh, those effects are conditioned by all these different factors, uh, which is not surprising. Uh, we find specifically that for my vote counted that social media activity by the state Facebook account was positive um, and none of the other voter education measures. Um, the, our measures of voter education were null when it comes to um, evaluating voter confidence at the county level. When we compare voter confidence at the state level and nationwide, we do find evidence that additional investment by the state measured by how much money they spend on communications and the jurisdiction uh, commitment on private funding that was used part of it for uh, voter education were significant and positive in explaining um, statewide voter confidence, but not nationwide. And our measures of voter ed education were not significant at the nationwide level, which kind of suggests that um, those, um, the national narrative about stolen elections and other factors were influential. Now, I will not go, I don't think I have enough time, I will not go through our overall findings, but I will go, we met, we, we investigated with Mara whether who, whether those who are mostly predisposed, uh, you know, Trump supporters, those who voted for Trump, those who believe that voter fraud exists, whether voter education can actually uh, inoculate them, right? Not completely change their minds, but inoculate them. And we do find evidence of that. So this is um, the, the, we, the margins for uh, my vote counted model. So uh, I feel confident that my vote counted as intended by perceptions about vote stealing, that it, it, it happens frequently, it occurs, and how uh, a hypothetical voter voted and whether they voted for Trump in 2016. And of course, the trend is negative, which is not surprising, but if we compare uh, those who live in a state whose election official was active on Facebook uh, versus not, we do see some differences. And that we consider evidence to suggest that even those who are uh, more predisposed to believe that elections were stolen, that fraud is rampant, uh, they might um, feel less strongly about uh, you know, votes not being voter, uh, counted as intended if their state invests in voter education. We find similar direction when we uh, move to the other models that where voter education was significant. And again, this tells a consistent story that voter education can be meaningful and substantively affect uh, attitudes even among those who are more resistant to it. 
Um, so our important findings are that uh, we do find evidence that the voter experience, especially at the local level, shapes personal voter confidence. This is consistent with control um, variables being significant for personal voter experiences, like the local election official being committed. Uh, we also find evidence that state level investment also matters. Um, and uh, we do find, as I said before, positive impact even among those most prone to election denial. Um, the fact that we don't find significant evidence are a hypothesis or no when it comes to nationwide uh, voter confidence. Um, this is, of course, concerning. Uh, that can really suggest that the national narratives of uh, voter fraud um, can really uh, make it very hard for those voters to overcome the concerns about, oh, votes across the nation were uh, counted as intended. Uh, we uh, Something that we added and we don't have in the paper right now, uh, and we're thinking how come we didn't think about it before, uh, whether the party of the state election official has an impact. And we did, uh, indeed, we found some evidence for voting confidence nationwide and negative um, relationship for those voters whose election official uh, was Republican, they were less likely to feel confident that the vote that votes nationwide counted, which is again consistent, unfortunately, with those narratives that we see all the time. So our next steps are, uh, we need to drill deeper, we need to better understand what we mean by voter education, that's a major challenge and methodologically, uh, what other measures can we find other than social media and spending. And of course, uh, the fundamental question that we try to investigate now is what is the exact mechanism? What are some things that election officers are doing to make voters resilient to misinformation? And how can we build trust in elections? And we hope that with this research, we uh, take a step further and we, we kind of answer a little bit of the puzzle uh, between voter education and voter confidence. Thank you. Mm -hmm.